So first, I'm going to start off with the very big picture of how um, all these things fit together, this big picture of quantum technology. And I'm going to give two different points of view on it. So first, we're just thinking about how this has become a huge industrial, um, uh, industrial effort. A huge industrial effort with companies all over the world, all thinking about how um, these things fit together, um, including uh, QBrain, welcome to our summer camp. Um, a lot of other uh, companies are all working towards realizing this dream of quantum computation. We're all here to, to teach you how quantum computers work, how to use quantum computers, but then there's a lot of people who are building them. So we're trying to preempt this um, through the summer camp. But why are these companies interested in quantum computing? Uh, a lot of, in quantum technologies more broadly, they all have their various reasons, but the bird's eye view of the quantum information, quantum technology landscape is really three main areas that, uh, that cause people to get excited about quantum computing. You can think of quantum computing itself, where you're doing some sort of computational work. You think of quantum cryptography, or quantum communication, where you're trying to protect information. And there's quantum sensing, where you're trying to detect small variations, small changes. Um, we're going to be focused on quantum computing because that's what our emphasis is. And as I mentioned yesterday, I've been working on quantum computing for many, many years, um, since uh, 2006 or so. Um, and this, what, what I've been focused on mainly is looking at simulating quantum time evolution. So this is one of the places where we expect that quantum computers will have an exponential speed up. So exponential, we'll get into what these ideas of exponential, quadratic, and polynomial. So these different terms we'll get into. So um, we have a number of mathematics modules that will go through a lot of these concepts, but I want to give you a big picture of it. These exponential improvements are improvements that are much, much faster than what you'd expect to be able to do classically. So Schwartz factoring algorithm affects this RSA technology. This is a technology that people have um, inside of most browsers that allows you to encrypt information using the fact that factoring a large number is difficult to do. Quantum simulation um, is, is where you can use this for ideas like pharmaceuticals, um, quantum chemistry, understanding material science. Um, this also is a place where you expect to get an exponential speed up over your classical algorithms. Then you also have where you get a more modest speed up, a quadratic improvement. So you think of x squared rather than two to the x. So you have this, these notions will, will clarify um, subsequently. But you also have a number of different methods that show up here that are also inside this quantum realm that also give some speed up, but not as dramatic. And that would be things like sensing. So you want to sense something better. So you have precision measurements. You want to present what time it is. So you want to measure the time more accurately. You can imagine using quantum technology for that. Lastly, there's this idea of information theory. So um, we've touched a little bit on cryptography. Um, this is notion of teleportation, secure communication, all these different notions. So here's um, just some diagram, some, some pseudo diagram of, of how you might expect the lock and key to fit together inside of so quantum uh, visualization of the density matrix. Okay, that's a very big picture of how quantum fits together in my head. Um, and, and what we'll be able to do is pull out how we're going to apply these different uh, areas that you see here, these three areas, to tasks that are of interest to whatever you, whatever you find fascinating, whatever the industrial interest is, whatever your um, personal passions are. Okay. So with that in hand, uh, just some overview of kind of how this whole quantum domain fits together. What I'd like to do is um, bring in another idea. So when we talk about quantum mechanics, uh, in the history of quantum mechanics, there's a lot of work that goes on from physicists, people thinking about physics, thinking about how mechanics works. Um, the presentation that Andrea gave was very nice. Um, and another place that quantum mechanics introduces quite nicely is from thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is this notion of how heat uh, is transferred, how heat moves around, how uh, different bodies of heat transfer this uh, energy, how molecules and atoms, things like that, interact inside of some environment that's not at zero temperature. So can I get a, a little sense of the room? Um, a sense of how many people have, uh, have heard of Maxwell's demon or have heard of these concepts already? Okay, nope, 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 nope. Great, 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 great. Okay. All right, excellent. All right, so that, that means that I'm not, I'm not uh, belaboring a point that's too simple for anyone. Uh, yeah, okay. 
So the second law of thermodynamics, okay, so, so Maxwell, Zeeman, no. Okay, how about the second law of thermodynamics? Second law of thermodynamics is a reasonable question. I see a lot of nopes, I see a lot of yeses. Um, I would say for those of you who have not, um, this is a famous quote from C.P. Snow. Um, and it says, uh, he's talking to some, some, he's at a house party. And uh, at the house party, people are asking him about uh, various topics and he starts asking them. He asked the other people at the house party, how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics? I was asking something which is the scientific equivalent of have you read a work of Shakespeare, right? So that's to say how fundamental this notion of um, the second law of thermodynamics is. So I have here depicted um, is a steam engine. So all of us has, have cars, vehicles, airplanes, all these things use energy. Uh, we have beer, um, which is Prescott Joule, James Prescott Joule, who has a unit of energy Joule named after him, is uh, PV equals NRT, that's the ideal gas law. Uh, but that's not, that's not the second law, that's a different law. Um, and this is uh, Ludwig von Boltzmann. So the main idea of the second law of thermodynamics, for those of you who have, haven't seen it in a long time, is simply that heat goes from the hot body to the cold. You never have it going the reverse, right? Um, it just says that if this thing's hot, this object's hot, and you put it next to something cold, well, this won't continue to heat up, but rather will cool down, and the cold object will heat up. So heat always goes from hot to cold. That's effectively what um, it says, right? You can think of heat as being somehow the, the disorder. So if you think of heat as disorder, you can think of it as how, how much these molecules are bouncing around, how quickly they're moving, things like this that are closely related to this idea of heat, right? So the idea is that with the second law of thermodynamics, the heat flows from hot bodies to cold bodies, okay? A little review. Um, turns out this will be relevant for us thinking through Maxwell's demon. So James Clerk Maxwell, you guys have heard of him, uh, of course, the Maxwell's equations that were mentioned yesterday. We were talking about electricity and magnetism. He also was uh, hugely influential inside the fields of, well, basically all the fields of mathematics and science at that time, including thermodynamics. So in this area of thermodynamics, you think about the second law of thermodynamics, that the heat has to go from the hot body to the cold. And uh, he goes on to think of this notion of how to violate the second law of thermodynamics. And he fabricates this idea of a small demon. So we conceive of a being, and this is demon in the old school sense. So if you, uh, if you use a computer enough and you've ever looked around inside the computer, it's demon, D-E-A-M-O-N. So originally, demon wasn't necessarily a, a negative. Uh, yes, it is the equivalent of entropy increase. Um, there's, a, there's many different ways to say the second law of thermodynamics. Um, I didn't want to introduce entropy too explicitly, but you can think of this entire argument entirely in terms of entropy. Um, so in that, that will also connect very nicely to the notion of information if you, if you know how that's connected. Otherwise, we'll just leave it at this level. Um, so this, this quote from Maxwell says, if we conceive of a being, who can see the individual molecules, who can open and close this hole so as to allow only the swifter molecules to pass from A to B, and only the slower molecules to pass from B to A, he will thus, without expenditure of work, raise the temperature of B and lower that of A. So effectively, this demon here inside this, inside this uh, picture is able to take the hot particles and put them on one side and separate it from the cold particles. And this is effectively running, um, running this heat gradient backwards. Okay, running the heat the wrong way, as it were. Okay, so let me pause here and see, do I have any questions? Here we go. Um, so A and B are just the, the labels for, the, uh, for the, the, the two reservoirs. So these are, you can imagine, like containers of gas. And there's, there's the hot gas particles that are red, and the cold gas particles are blue. And it's just some, some it's almost like a balloon with a, a door in between it. You can open and close the door. Um, and no molecules formed. Any, any other questions here before I, I don't want to go too fast. Okay. Yeah, so actually that's, these are all really nice arguments. So this, this idea of Maxwell's demon is introduced in 1867 and it goes on to be an argument for the next 100, 200. You can even argue about it now. Um, and, and so the main idea of why the slower ones go, um, through one hole, it's that the demon's measuring how quickly or slowly it is, right? And we're also assuming that he can open this very, very tiny door without using any energy, right? So we'll assume that he can open the door without doing any work, right? Or effectively zero work, 
right? You can imagine a door super tiny relative to the size of the system. Um, and why did the slower ones go from B to A? Um, well, he's going to put the door to prevent it. Okay, what are we trying to establish? Right. So then, what are we trying to establish? Okay, I will take that as an as a indicator to move forward. Okay, so if we're trying to establish here, we're trying to think through, can we violate the second law of thermodynamics, right? So if we have the second law of thermodynamics and we have this little demon who can violate it, then how come we can't see at the larger level hot, the, the temperature, the, the, the heat going from the cold object to the hot object? Why can't we see this little tiny demons that are controlling this? We never see that. And um, what's really nice is that this gets us to a way of to start thinking about computation. So Leo Slizzard, um, in 1929, so Leo Slizzard, if you, if you, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, Slizzard, Slizzard, I'm not sure. Um, however, his influence on America as a country is not to be understated. He had a huge influence in the American um, uh, um, nuclear weapon program. He was actually one of the most influential scientists for actually convincing the president to pursue nuclear um, weapons technologies, um, as a side note. Um, he also thought about thermodynamics, and he introduced this notion of Maxwell's demon, but a very, very small Maxwell's demon. What he says is that, okay, Maxwell's demon is going to try and get some work out of this system, going to try and cheat the energy gradient, try and somehow steal a little, bit, little bits of, a, of, of heat flow in the wrong direction. So Leo says, well, maybe I can use this to get out some work. Maybe we can get out a little bit of work. Right? And so he says, okay. If I start off with the partition, I have just to simplify the whole problem as simple as we can get. This is one thing that I've learned over the many years of doing science is that starting with the simplest case, a lot of times it helps you understand how to even attack a problem. So thinking about this problem, Maxwell's demon, all these particles moving around, and he has this little door, and how much energy used for the door, and how many gas particles are there, these are all very good questions. So we simplify it down to one gas particle, perhaps it's much easier to analyze. And this is this idea of Slizzard's engine. It's one gas particle, and the idea is this gas particle can bounce around, and in the middle here is a partition, and this partition is, is movable. So when the particle bounces off of it, it'll move this partition a little bit over, right? The idea is that the demon, instead of actually opening and closing the door, he can just attach a pulley. So what it'll do is it say if the particle is on, is on this side, then it'll attach the pulley over here. If the particle were on the other side, he'd attach the pulley on the other side and let the particle push the door the other way. So in this case, he's attached to pulley. This ball keeps bouncing around. Boom, 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 boom. It would be better if we had a movie. Um, and then it expands this, and he gets out a little bit of work. Okay. And then he'd go back, then he put in the partition again, and then see which side the gas particle is on, and then look on the left to right and think about it. Okay. So I'm going to leave this as a question just for a second, just to kind of get you guys to think. So I got one of the questions in the chat was, what does this have to do with anything? Okay. So I'm going to ask, do you, does anyone have any, any guesses as to how this connects back to the larger discussion that we're having on computation? Any guesses? Any ideas? Yeah, so this is a, this is a, a good guess. So, it, so it's asking questions about energy. Um, we're thinking about controls, thinking about um, the, uh, the length of zero, one values. So zero, one value is going to correspond to left to right. And, and, and these are all great ideas. This is exactly what the problem design is, is kind of separate all these things. So in this case, we're going to try and not use energy and just think of just in terms of this, in terms of which side he's going to put this weight on. So he's going to control from the left or from the right. And all the controls that he has to do in order to control something, you also have to know where it's at. And this connects us directly to this idea of information rather than just energy. So we have energy as some notion of, of distinguishing which states which, but we also have this notion of just knowing are we on the left or right. So the idea um, and the resolution for this paradox is that Maxwell's demon actually is learning. So his memory itself is actually becoming disordered. So it's becoming heated up. So you can imagine his memory, his brain is going to keep working. And as his brain works, he's going to get, he's going to use his brain. It's going to cause entropy that he's taking, uh, it's going to cause the same separation. So as he extracts heat and the heat goes from the wrong direction from A to B, his memory is getting disordered by the same amount. 
This is one way to resolve this paradox. It's the idea that every time he does a measurement, every time he learns something, he's also, he's also um, getting information. And that information also has some thermodynamic cost. Okay, so this is the idea that information itself is a physical construct. That is, memory itself also counts as part of the thermodynamic system. And there's one way to say that the demon can't cheat the second law of thermodynamics because his brain is also heating up as he's making the system cool down. Okay, so this is just a motivation for this idea of information being physical. Um, okay, so let me let that digest for a second. So all these ideas here of Maxwell's demon is taking the idea of the demon itself being able to do a computation to decide whether to put the, 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 the pulley on the left side or the right side requires him to write down whether the, the ball's on the left or right. And he's going to write it down at the first time, left or right, second time is left or right, third time, left or right, so on and so forth, left, left, right, left, left, right, left, right. And he keeps going like this, and, and eventually his memory would be disordered with left, right, left, right, left, right, right, left, left, right, left, right, left, right. The same thing is if it heated up as, the, as, the, as this, this uh, system cools down. So you can imagine that his memory being a physical thing ha also has to hold that information. And that's what we want to get across, this notion of information as being a physical thing. Yeah, because I didn't mean to include this. You can ignore the bottom part. The idea here is that this gives us a notion of, of a quantum bit. So we think of a bit, not so much a bit as being an actual a digital thing inside your computer, but you can imagine a bit being a message I want to send to you, but I only have two possibilities. Um, uh, I think a nice example that I like to use when, when I'm explaining this idea of a bit um, is that if we have a secret meeting, we're either going to meet at 3 p.m. or we're not going to meet at 3 p.m., but I don't want anyone else to know. Okay? So you can imagine that I might have something that's going to hold that information from me. Right? So maybe I have um, an empty glass, okay? or I have a glass that has pins in it. And if I leave the glass that has pins in it out, then you know that we're going to have the meeting at 3 o'clock. If I leave the empty glass, I take out all the pins, and you know that we're not going to meet at 3 o'clock. Right? But that's just two possibilities, so that's one bit. But that possibility is being stored in a physical object, either the empty jar or the full jar. And this is going to actually be the object that carries that information. The same thing that if we're going to let an object carry that information, be it your brain, be it um, you know, a carpet being turned to the left or to the right, a statue being turned upside down or turned to the left, you can imagine all these things holding information for you. You can imagine using a quantum information carrier to hold that information for you as well. And that's what gets us to this notion of Quantum, com quantum computers. Uh, but first, let's take a second and just realize from this discussion what I wanted to get across, the whole idea of bringing up this Maxwell's demon, bringing up this, this one potential resolution of Maxwell's demon, is to get you to think that the information itself is physical. The information itself has to be treated with physics, right? You have to think of information carriers as actual objects in the physical world that you manipulate with physical manipulations, right? Whether it's electrical, magnetic, or just pushing the object over. These are all physical interactions that you use to manipulate computers. So to uh, round out the rest of this talk, what I want to do is give a notion of abstract computers, realistic computers, and quantum computers, right? So um, this is kind of zooming in from a very theoretical picture of computers to more realistic picture of computers and hopefully setting us up for a nice discussion for the rest of the week and the rest of the summer camp. So this notion of a Turing machine is going to be discussed uh, inside the next uh, module. And so I thought I'd introduce it here um, with a little bit of some toy examples that, that we can play around with. i um, not sure if we have time for breakout rooms, but if we have extra time at the end, then perhaps there's a small example that you can play around with um, in groups even. Okay. So Alan Turing is um, a very intelligent scientist. In fact, if you haven't seen the movie, I'd recommend Imitation Game. Um, he's involved heavily during the war um, with thinking of ways of defeating crypto cryptography, building computers, using computers, thinking a lot about uh, computer science foundations of, of, of uh, and he in fact founds the entire notion of computer science. Um, when people first founded the notion of computer science, the original notion was about what is computable and what's not, which is very different than where we're at now, where we're thinking about how easy is it to compute something, how difficult is it to compute something, but rarely do we ask is it computable or not. But Alan Turing introduced this idea of algorithms and Turing machines in order 
to answer some questions about computability. Um, and what I want to do is give you some examples of how this Turing machine works. Okay. Were there any questions from so far, as far as information, just the, the notion of it being physical, and um, before we turn in, before we go towards Turing machines? Okay. So um, there's a very famous paper by Charles Binnick where he talks about thermodynamics and computing, where he's thinking about computers. Um, and this is where the Turing machine works is that it's going to be just some object or some person or something that has a pen and is able to write down something on a piece of tape. So here's a tape that has zeros and ones. There's some alphabet in this tape. And there's some transition rules that you give to the computer. The idea is I'm going to give the computer some input. It'll be some, some strip that has numbers on it. The computer will run, compute some algorithm, and then in the end, it will follow these transition rules and come back and tell you what the answer is. So for instance, it says A, so you're in state A, and you read the, the, the bit zero, then it says you switch, you change the zero to a one, you move to the right, and you change the state beta. Right, so let's just see what happened here. Move from zero, erase the zero, wrote down a one, moved over, and then changed this to a zero, and then you're in state beta. Okay. This is a very basic idea of how a formal computer works. Um, the idea is that these transition rules and this tape notion is enough to design an Apple um, iPhone, enough to design a, uh, a complicated calculator, um, enough to design a supercomputer or a desktop. Right? All the computers are executing essentially the same capabilities of a large piece of tape and some transition rules. This is a terrible way to program a computer, not terrible, but a difficult way to program a computer. Now we have programming languages like C++, Python, Jupyter Notebooks that make things much easier than having to go through writing down these transition rules. Um, one of, uh, yeah. So one, um, one thing I'd like to, to give an example of, and this is a little tinier than I expected, but this is a notion of a, um, a very physical idea of a, of a computer, right? This is where if you had a biological computer, you can imagine that a person, you know, somebody's DNA is going to carry out some sort of computation. Here, there's some string. Now this string is going to be some polymers uh, with zeros and ones representing different uh, possibilities for the polymers. There's some enzyme that's going to execute this transition rule. And you have these, these molecules that are going to drive the reaction one way or the other. Um, the details is not so important, but the point is, is that this is executing the same thing that takes you from zero A to erases the, the, the zero, replaces it with the one, transitions to a zero beta, okay? That's to say everything else on this side uh, over here, in some sense you can ignore, but the point is that there's a way of constructing something that can do this rule. Once you can do this rule, you can say, all right, it's simple enough to support the notion of a Turing machine, then you can imagine that this is how you can imagine having biological computers. And so we're not gonna talk about biological computers, but the point is, is that this notion of a Turing machine is very broad. There's a lot of things can end up being a Turing machine. We wanna think of is quantum computers as Turing machines, and that will give us, um, oh, no, sorry, quantum, sorry. Here's an example of a Turing machine. And I like this example here. I made this because I was thinking about Turing machines and the notion that Alan Turing actually had in his head when he's thinking of a Turing machine is an actual person to do this um, work. So in around the turn of the century, computers were people. Um, and I think we pointed this out. Um, if you think about, um, if you think about the, the uh, Hidden Figures movie, where there's a lot of uh, people doing the calculations for the space race. Well, one of the original reasons that people uh, developed a lot of these computers, if you think of um, uh, GMT, so it's Greenfield me um, Mean Time, you have uh, a lot of computers calculating tables to solve the uh, east-west problem, right? So you have a lot of people who are doing computations by hand in order to compute something that's of interest to society more broadly. So Alan Turing was thinking how to formalize the instructions you give to a person who's your computer. So this is a set of instructions I could give to you in the scratch sheet of paper that had a zero, zero on it, and I could ask you to follow these rules and tell me, did it get accepted or did it get rejected? And it's a very simple way of, uh, of understanding machines. Okay. Are Turing machines anything we follow the rules of assigning zero or one between their states? Um, so the Turing machine, the simplest way is that it's just 
the it's just you can imagine it's actually a person with some well-defined set of instructions and some scrap paper and a pencil and eraser right that's what you should think of a turing machine as a person who's going to do the compute who's going to do the computation for you and you're going to give them instructions on what to do so you can imagine your pc the same thing you want your pc to, to figure out um whether these two bits add up to one or whether they add up to zero or they add up to two right and you can have you, you can ask your machine to decide this right so the acronyms BGN, SWP, and CHK are just the states that you can be in. So SWP would be like swap, BGN would be like begin, and then um, CHK is like check. So it's just, these are just, this is a very toy model, um, but I made this up to give a very concrete example of how a Turing machine will work. So I think this would be reasonable to test out, um, to actually take a screenshot and see if it works and actually see what, what inputs would be accepted, what inputs would be rejected. That's a, a Turing machine, I think. Um, in the in module two, there'll be some cursory mention of Turing machines, but then we go from there directly to programming and Python. I'm spending too much time with Turing machines. The idea of um, quantum Turing machines and different types of Turing machines is that you have this computer with this set of instructions in these different states, and, and you can give these Turing machines different amounts of capability. This gives rise to different notions of, of how powerful quantum, a, a Turing machine is. And if you give this Turing machine access to quantum resources, then you have a quantum computer. If you give it access to, say, random dice, then you'd have a Monte Carlo computer. If you give it access to limited amounts of space, you can imagine that that also limits what algorithms you can solve and how quickly. So a lot of these notions of, of, of what a Turing machine can and can't do are all around what power did you give this, you know, person, computer, in order to solve this task you've given them. Okay. And the algorithm would be this instructions. The set of instructions is the algorithm that tells them how to take some input, transform it to the output. Okay. And then you could also think of some algorithm like this, how many steps did it take for this, for this computer to, to get to the reject or accept state, also being something that determines how well or how poorly your algorithm is. Yeah, another question. All right, yeah, I think that's all. Um... Okay. It's not a very apt title, but um, yeah. So as I was saying, is that there's many different notions of computers. You have mechanical devices that are gonna do a computation. You put in some input, and this is the adding machine. You just then crank and crank the shaft, and all of a sudden comes out the answer. You have a room full of computers here where they're computing ballistic tables for World War II. Um, and this gives rise to a whole, a whole notion of, error, of, of quality control. Um, so actually deciding which, which answer you should accept is, is some, some theory behind it. But in any case, there's a lot of different ways of designing computers. We have now modern computers where you have digital devices. Um, we have multi-core digital devices. We have cloud computer digital devices. And now we have cloud accessible quantum computers. So with this notion of quantum computers here, we're taking this idea of still having a Turing machine, this notion where we're giving some set of instructions to a computer, asking it to execute these instructions and give us back an answer, right? In this case, our, our information carrier is no longer a sheet of paper, but rather some quantum sheet of paper, effectively a quantum sheet of paper, some quantum object that's gonna contain that information. And then we're gonna have some set of gates that are gonna allow us to transform it. We'll get into what all these gates are, what these things mean. Um, subsequently, but the idea is that we have this physical information carrier, we're going to manipulate it with some physical process, and at the end we're going to do some measurement, as Andre already discussed, this notion of measurement, to actually read out what the answer is. Did you read the accept state or the reject state? And did we get to accept the answer or reject the answer? So this is the same notion, but now we want to use quantum resources to accomplish these tasks. Okay. And where I wanted to end, um, I guess we still have 15 minutes so we can try out the exercise. But where I wanted to end is with this notion of Schrodinger's conversation piece. So we haven't introduced Schrodinger's equation yet, but I think this gives a very nice understanding of how quantum computation and quantum simulation speak to, to one another. So my main area of research is on quantum simulation. And so with quantum simulation, the idea is that we want to simulate Schrodinger's equation. And uh, there's a fam famous quote from Dirac, and he says, the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory for a large part of physics and the whole chemistry is thus completely known. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble, right? So the notion here is that we can use a quantum computer to solve these equations, right? 
But then at the same time, we need to solve these equations to build a quantum computer, right? So that's, that's where we build a better quantum computer, we can solve more equations, we solve more equations, we can build a better quantum computer. And then so hopefully by teaching and learning Schrodinger's equation, both from the engineering side and from the theory side, both from how do we apply it inside of a, inside of a place like the quiz kit, or how do we understand how do we design a better computer at IBM, or how do we design a better quantum computer, a better quantum storage device at uh, Google, and how do we actually you know, program it with CERN. That's just, this is what we want to kind of think this through. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, we have about 15 minutes. So what I was thinking we would leave with is just to give everyone a chance to eat, actually test this out. I'm not sure that um, if we go into the breakout rooms, I think it should be easy enough to see. Uh, what is the quantum gate? Oh, so, oh, um, so this question about what is the quantum gate, um, don't stress about what the quantum gates are. We're not gonna get into that just yet. Um, we'll actually cover that in detail and get to the modules. But the idea of a quantum gate, and just to give some notion, it's just like one of these transition rules, right? So you can imagine that a quantum gate is just one operation that you can do with a quantum computer, like an erasure or writing a number down. That's very vague, but we'll get into much more detail. Um, the original formulation of quantum, well, one of the original formulations of quantum computers is, is in terms of quantum computer science. So when people think of quantum computer science, they think of actually talking about quantum Turing machines. Um, so, yeah, so the quantum Turing machine would be something that manipulated qubits, right? So rather than manipulating bits, it'd be manipulating qubits and have some way of, of rotating a qubit rather than just changing it from zero to one, it'd have some other operations. And those operations that it'd be able to do on each qubit would be called quantum gates. Yeah, so there's, there's a way of formalizing this notion. First line is blank. Do you change it to reject? Uh, in this case, the first line is zero. So I would say actually just try testing it out. Um, so if you want to test out this this um, this uh, algorithm here, try starting with um, line one with zero and line two with zero, um, or line line try zero zero, try zero. One and one. So if you try those inputs, you can see which ones are accepted or rejected. Um, it's a little tedious, but the, the idea is that um, these are just these are just how a Turing machine would work if you think of it being formally. So it's like if I gave you the instructions to follow these, and you could do it and tell me whether you should accept this input or output. And I could hand you many, many sheets of paper and you go through and accept or reject all these sheets of paper and that would then have all my papers classified into whether it's zero, one, one, zero, whether zero, zero, one, one, inside of some very algorithmic way. What is a qubit? Is it a physical object? Yes, a qubit is very much a physical object. That was the thing that I was trying to get across here is that um, in terms of what this entire, what I wanted to get across in this lecture is that um, you have to think of all these things as very much physical objects. That even in the, in the case of a computer, in the case of your digital computer, the computer that you're on, there are physical things that are holding this information, um, physical charges that hold it. And so the, the, the qubits in this case, so here's some examples of qubits. You can imagine a photon as a qubit. You can imagine a nitrogen vacancy as a qubit. Semiconductor quantum, um, semiconductor quantum dot as a qubit. A, a trapped ion as a qubit. A nuclear magnet, uh, a magnetic spin as a qubit. Or as we as we will see with um, IBM's quantum computer, superinducting loops or what's being used at IBM, Google, and uh, D-Wave. But in every case, anytime you have a computer, you have to have a physical object that is that is there. Um, to actually do the computation, to actually hold the information. So hopefully that answers the question. Given so many types of qubits, one better than the other. Um, in terms of like practical matters, yes, they, so they have different strengths um, and for different reasons. So these are actually different, different physical things. So, so some things are going to interact more with the environment. Some things will interact less with the environment. How much it does or does not interact with the environment will also um, dictate how easy it is to control. So you have issues of whether you can control the object, or whether you can, whether the environment can influence the object. And this is kind of a trade-off. In terms of what's uh, the most advanced technology right now, super, in super inducting qubits, 
ion trapped or um, trapped ions is also becoming more available as a technology, but some of the other technologies have trouble coupling and, and growing out the number of spins. Quantum optics, there's also a company that's, um, that's uh, building quantum computers around this notion of, 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 of a photon as a qubit. But a lot, the main problem is whether, so the main question of whether qubits or even bits or even computers is what technology can scale up. When you think of semiconductor technology uh, for class computers, it's scaled up because it works so well so when people use it, but you can imagine building a computer out of something else um, entirely and, and you know, out of pulleys and chains, right? It would still work, but it would just be slower. It might not build up as fast. What makes the base do it matter? Or is it working uniform? Um, so, so, the deep, so, so, like, like Andrea said, we'll study the math, we'll study qubits and the mathematics more detail. But here, this is a preview. And the idea is that um, what we're going to be using in the camp will actually be simulators. We're not actually going to, um, we're not actually going to have. Um, yeah, I, so from the point of view of how you interface with the computer, or you think of how the point of view of how you interface with the car, for instance, you don't actually worry about the, inject, the fuel injection system of a car. You just run it, right? And similarly, similarly for a computer, you don't worry about the cache and the registers and all these different parts of the computer. You can use a programming language to help uh, to just do it directly. So it's a technology where you don't have to cool the system down to make qubits controllable. Um, there are ideas for doing room temperature quantum computing, but uh, again, if you have something at room temperature, there's a lot of things coming in from the environment that will affect your qubit. Um, so I'll punt on that question, so I don't know, but uh, it's, it's gonna be more difficult to prevent the environment from influencing your system if it's not you, if you're at room temperature. Room temperature is relatively hot compared to quantum systems, so. All right. James, do you know what the what the solution is for this? Is what are the accept or reject inputs? I made this years ago. <laughs> I think it's uh, I think it's parity based. I think it's only okay. zero zero and one one, but I don't remember. Okay. I think it, it'd be interesting to find out if it's if it even <laughs> works, right? <laughs> yeah, that's actually really I good. This, I'll probably maybe I'll I actually do it over the break. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice example. I think it's 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 worthwhile to do just to get some notion of how a Turing machine works, and it's a little more constructive than going through a bunch of you know, epsilons and deltas, literally. Yep. Yeah. yeah.